Well, and thank you for joining the webinar today. We're going to give folks another minute or two to join and log in. Uh, we'll be starting soon. All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2022-23 Better Buildings webinar series uh, dedicated to bringing you the latest actionable insights from leading industry experts. This annual series is a chance to explore the topics, technologies, and trends that affect your organization, as well as efforts to accelerate decarbonization and energy, efficient, energy efficiency adoption. Today's webinar is called Design to Deliver, Lessons Learned from Architects, Engineers, and Contractors in Zero Carbon Buildings. Architects, engineers, and contractors are essential in designing and delivering buildings uh, in order to offer top value to clients while meeting energy and carbon goals. Today's discussion is looking at the relationship between those who deliver buildings, such as architects, engineers, and contractors, and building owners. It largely is a result of the efforts of the Better Buildings Design and Construction Allies, a part of Better Buildings that is working to overcome industry barriers and to promote the routine delivery of zero energy and zero carbon buildings. It is an opportunity to hear insights from leading contributors from the architecture, engineering, and construction industries. Today, we have Paul Hutton from Cunningham Group, Kirsten Washley from CMTA, and Patty Lloyd from Leopardo Companies. Each will share their unique real-world insights and what it takes to achieve energy and carbon reduction goals. But before we dive in, here are a few house housekeeping points I would like to cover. Please note today's webinar will be recorded and archived on the Better Building Solutions Center. We will follow up when today's recording and slides are made available. Next, attendees are in listen only mode, meaning your microphones are muted. If you experience or any audio or visual issues throughout the webinar, please send a message in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your Zoom panel. My name is Paul Tursellini and I am your moderator for today. I'm a principal engineer at the National Renewable Energy Lab and work with the Better Buildings Design and Construction Allies, as well as technical aspects of the Better Climate Challenge. We will start today with some polls using the Slido platform and have short presentations from an architect, engineer, and a contractor. From then, we'll move to a panel discussion followed by questions from you, our audience. If you're interested in joining 
the design and construction allies and are involved directly in the design and delivery of buildings. That is design professionals who perhaps stamp drawings or a contractor that is actively building buildings. We'll provide a link um, in the additional resources near the end of the webinar. Uh, next slide. So a little bit about the design and construction allies. Um, it was formed really to meet a gap uh, between what owners were desiring for buildings and getting design professionals and contractors aligned with that. And so today we're going to hear about some of the gaps that the group has discovered and worked through. Really the goal and the challenge of this, the challenge that I give to this group is what is stopping you from routinely designing and delivering these zero ready buildings every day in every project? Um, and then trying to address, identify and address those barriers. Um, we have about 23 per firms that are currently participating and the website for the allies is uh, on the screen now. As we identify those barriers, we form working groups which look to identify solutions and then implement those solutions in their firms as they work with clients like uh, some of you in our audience. Um, once we do that, then the objective is to disseminate and try to scale those solutions. Uh, next slide. So at this time, uh, we'd like you to go to slido.com, which is the interactive polling platform that we're going to be using. So please go to slido.com and on your mobile device or opening a new window in your internet browser, today's event code is pound DOE. If you'd like to ask our panelists questions, please submit them anytime through the presentation on this platform. We'll be answering your questions near the end of the webinar. You can also select the thumbs up icon for questions that you like that somebody else submitted, which will result in the most popular questions moving to the top of the queue. Before we start and to get you a little warmed up on uh, using Slido, we wanna start with some polls today. And so first we wanna learn a little bit about you today. Um, so on the screen, you have the polls. The first one is to describe your organization. And there are some options there that are available. So great, it looks like we're, we're actually pretty evenly distributed between our different uh, kind of partner and sectors. And we also have a about a quarter of the audience um, is in kind of that design delivery process for buildings. So that is great that we have this broad spectrum of you on the line today to enjoy this uh, discussion. Uh, next, uh, Paul, please. Okay, so now we're gonna ask you some specific questions about uh, what you're implementing. And the first one is, have you ever implemented low carbon technologies in your uh, building portfolio? Definitely applaud the kind of the, the small group there that actually is doing this in every building project that you have. And uh, certainly uh, we'd like to hear from you in the Q&A time uh, with your questions or comments on how you achieve that. And it looks like uh, many of you over half have uh, started thinking about this and have implemented a couple of times. And again, you know, uh, feel free to challenge our panel with some of your barriers and uh, let's hear from their responses as they come back. We'll give this just a couple more seconds here. All right, I think we can move on to the third poll question. What is your primary motivation for implementing low carbon technologies? Roughly half of you are doing it to meet a, a corporate climate or greenhouse gas target. Um, 
and maybe your organization doesn't have a target and you're you're still engaging with those and, and moving your organization uh, in that direction. So I see about a quarter seem to fit into that uh, category. All right. Well, thank you very much. So uh, let's move on. I think there's one more. And this is a little bit more specific. Um, and we're curious, uh, have you used heat pumps for HVAC systems? Realizing that a lot of times, especially for the scope one, the on-site um, fossil fuels that are consumed uh, primarily for heating buildings, that heat pumps are one option for that. So we're curious on how many of you have thought about that. And so more than half have. So that, that's very encouraging. You know, again, thinking about uh, those technologies um, and how to use them. All right, so with that, let's move into some of the content here. And we have a, a great lineup of presenters and uh, with uh, some short presentations today. Um, Paul Hutton uh, joins us. He is the Director of Regenerative Design for Cunningham, a large international design firm. He guides the company's efforts to deliver regenerative projects in the healthcare, hospitality, education, workplace, and multifamily housing sectors. Under his guidance, the firm's portfolio has achieved energy reduction 56% below baseline. He has been a practicing architect for more than 40 years, and during which time his projects have pushed the envelope for energy efficiency, daylighting, sustainability, and resiliency. Uh, next, we have Patty Lloyd. Uh, Patty has almost 20 years of experience advancing sustainability in the built environment. She's an advocate for green building and a healthy high, and healthy high performance construction. She leads Leopardo's corporate sustainability efforts as well as contributing to all sustainable projects within the firm. She has served in many leadership roles in the green building industry, currently sitting on the USGBC Technical Committee and the AIA Illinois Board of Directors. Formerly, she was a board member and chair of the Illinois Green Alliance, USGBC Materials and Resources TAG, facilitates the Chicago Living Future community and volunteers on several working groups. She is a lead fellow, LFA, and well AP. And finally, we have Kirsten Washley. She's a building science engineer with CMTA's Boston office. She has a bachelor's of science degree in system engineering and sustainability and a master's in, in engineering management, as well as an MBA. She collaborates with building owners, utility companies, and third parties to benchmark, analyze, and design new and retrofit high performance buildings. She has been featured at national conferences like the 2022 ASHRAE Winter Conference and most recently the Net Zero 2022 Conference, where she has spoken on sustainable design topics like zero energy and decarbonization. She was recently named Emergency Change Agent of the Year by Built Environment Plus. So thanks to the three of you for being with us today. And with that, I'm going to hand it off first to Paul Hutton and please kick us off today. All right, next slide, if you would, please. Uh, good morning, I'm very excited to be here. Also honored to be uh, part of this uh, really top-notch group with a fellow engineer and contractor. A brief moment about Cunningham, I promise to keep this brief, just to give you some context for what kind of projects I work on. We have these five studios, you can see them listed there, along with some of the typical project types. I just wanna make quick note uh, that some of our clients do in fact push us toward uh, net zero carbon and that's great. We love those opportunities, but by and large, it's our job at Cunningham to be the change agent, to be actively promoting the, the push toward net zero energy and net zero carbon. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, please. As we are preparing for this uh, webinar, uh, our friends at the DOE asked us some really great questions. And, and I uh, chose to organize my brief presentation here around three of those questions that they asked us. And a few of the, the what I think are the top uh, responses that you might uh, hear about. 
So the first question was what I wish my clients knew. This list could easily be so much longer. I'm not gonna go through each of those in detail. We don't have time. I'll let you just absorb what's on the screen there. But there are a couple that I would like to touch on briefly. Uh, the first one would be that second bullet down. It's not just the engineers. And, and I put this one on the slide because so often I, I encounter clients who believe that if we use LED lighting designed by our electrical engineers, and we have a great uh, mechanical system, maybe with heat pumps, Paul, uh, designed by our mechanical engineers, that's it. That's what you have to do. And, and I have to let our clients know it takes a lot more than that. It takes an entire team, starting with the architect, including the engineers, and very importantly, also including your contractor to get to net zero. So it's not just the engineers, the architects have a role to play too. And very importantly, I, I've seen many projects that have fantastic engineering teams that haven't gotten to net zero, partly because the architect on that team wasn't up to it. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that fourth bullet point down. If you don't model it, you won't achieve it. We have great tools at our disposal in our firm and most firms these days. It's so important to use performance modeling to check how we're doing it every step of the way along the process. If we only model when we're getting near the end, that is not a recipe for getting to net zero. How about the next slide, please? Uh, this is the next question they asked us. How can you work with your design team to achieve better results? And I'm gonna start right with that first one here. Uh, don't rush into design. I see this happening so often. We really encourage our clients to start the overall design process with a workshop in which we talk about what are the possibilities, the strategies that we might consider to implement to get to our energy and carbon goals. And what I've seen happening is when the design is allowed to get started prematurely, before those goals have been together put into place, that first design vision sticks. It's, it's hard to get rid of it once it's out there. So I really work hard to get our projects and our teams to have the patience to work out the goals and then start the design process. I wanna hit that fourth bullet point next, consider new systems and materials. I see so many great designs get stymied because clients have fear around systems or materials they haven't used before. If, if your design team brings these kind of things to you, give it a fair hearing. If you need to do some research, if you need to go visit a project where they've been used or talk to other clients who've tried them out, do that. But don't just shut things down because they may be unfamiliar to you. Your, your design team you've hired for a reason, they, they have uh, good ideas, you need to hear them out. And how about the last slide of my group here, the next one. What should you ask your architect? Uh, I, I get the opportunity to go to a lot of interviews and respond to a lot of RFPs. And unfortunately, what I see is so many of the questions we get asked tend to be repeats from previous projects. They're generic questions. If, if you have zero carbon or zero energy goals, be really upfront with your architect and design team and ask them, what strategies have you used before to achieve these kind of goals? Which of these strategies do you think might be relevant on the project that you have in mind? Uh, don't be afraid to put the design team on the spot and ask those kind of hard questions. I'm convinced that the answers you get will tell you a lot about their readiness and capability to help you make it uh, to that end goal. And uh, I think the last one that I wanted to hit on here was how will energy modeling be used to impact your design process? That goes back a little bit to that earlier point, uh, but it's so important to us that energy modeling isn't just something we do at the end to see where we are, but we use it at every step of the way to measure our progress. In fact, at Cunningham Group, uh, we have within every one of our document sets one whole sheet that's dedicated to recording how that design is currently standing in regards to energy use, water use, and carbon emissions. So we think it's really important to have that be a tool that you use on a regular basis. And I think that should be just about my five minutes. All right, so it looks like I'm up. Um, thank you, Paul, for the introduction. As he said, my name is Kirsten Washley, and I'm a building science engineer with CMTA. Next slide. 
really excited to be here today with Paul, Paul, and Patty. Um, but a bit more about CMTA before I talk about my lessons learned. Uh, so we are a national firm. We have about 30 offices and green building is really our bread and butter. We have almost 10 million square feet of zero energy design that's operating right now. Uh, we've done 200 plus Energy Star projects. We have 75 plus megawatts of solar installation and miles and miles of geothermal well fields also in operation. We work across most market vertical verticals with the exception perhaps of residential. Um, and we focus not only on MEP design, but also advanced commissioning, sustainability consulting and performance contracting. Next slide, please. So this is just a little bit more about CMTA, but to speak to the audience here today, which I saw was heavily government owners and majority contractors and consultants, we really often come across the question, is it possible to retrofit something to net zero energy or zero operational carbon? And this slide is really just a resounding, yes, it is. So what you're looking at, if you can't read it on your screen, uh, the gray bars are operating EUIs from before, a retrofit project, and then the green are those same projects after um, we've done a retrofit design. So we drop anywhere from 149 is the highest before EUI um, down to a 46, and then we get as low as about a 22, uh, or no, a 20 rather. So it is possible even in existing buildings, and we'll talk more about that later, I'm sure. Next slide, please. So the things that I wish my clients knew, um, I think, I hope at least it'll be comforting that some of these points echo Paul's and I'm sure some of Patty's will echo mine. Um, so the message at least should be very clear. Uh, my first point is set the correct project goals and select the right team. And what I'm getting at here is being really clear with what you're aiming to achieve. So do you want it to be zero carbon? Uh, do you want it to be zero energy? Do you only want a lead sticker or an energy star? Making those really, really clear including them in the RFP, that's really gonna help you from the get-go. And then going into selecting the right team, you don't wanna be someone's experiment. So getting the right team that's on board with those goals, has experience designing that type um, of building is really, really gonna help you in the end because they can walk you through and educate in addition to designing what you're looking to get designed. Uh, and I think that this just really amplifies your chances of success. Next up, I have utilized resources out there. So there are a ton of things if you're not sure where to start uh, that could begin. So there are the advanced energy design guides, which are publicly available through the ASHRAE site, but was a coordination with NREL and the DOE. So the same folks putting on this webinar today. And in addition to sort of how to design and what's a green building, there's a lot of funding available if your building project includes these types of goals. There's the IRA, um, there's perhaps local utility programs. So you don't wanna forget that these things are out there and could potentially sway the path of your project um, if you do or don't utilize them. Next up, I have sharpen your pencils. So a lot of times um, we see conservative numbers, which there's a time and a place, right? We don't want structural engineers to not be conservative. However, if your electrical engineer is rounding up for the NEC code and then also giving the potential for additions later on, you end up with um, a much larger service size than perhaps you need. And that money could be spent somewhere else on a more efficient HVAC system so that you don't need to upsize your service. Um, there are different trade-offs. So just being really exact with um, when you're doing your design and this applies to cost estimates as well. So when I talked about selecting the right team, I said it's important for them to have experience. For instance, at CMTA, um, we do internal data tracking for all our projects. So we have a pretty good idea of the performance of our portfolio post-design. And with that data, when we do new design projects, we have this great base that we can compare against. So if we get an estimate from a contractor who hasn't done, let's say, um, a well field with geothermal uh, ground source heat pump system before, likely they're just going to mark it up because it's unfamiliar to them, right? And that can start to skew the decision-making process um, if you're looking at costs, which who doesn't look at costs, right? Um, so we you know, find it very important to work with all of the contractors and all of the team and make sure that what we're seeing is what's in alignment with the reality. And a lot of times we can sort of cross off some things in those cost estimates. 
So that's important to, to just be aware of. And lastly, it doesn't have to cost more. So you can do net zero at cost parity. You can do it in an existing building. It's just how you focus, you know, setting your goals from the beginning um, and then understanding where to spend the money. So perhaps you do buy a more efficient system, but then you don't have to buy as much solar on the back end to reach a net zero energy goal, for example. I think that wraps it up. I'll hand it over to Patty. Thanks, Kirsten. Good to see everybody today. I'm Patty Lloyd, Director of Sustainability at Leopardo Companies. Um, as Paul introduced me earlier, a couple things about Leopardo. We're a family owned company. We were founded in 1977. Uh, we're working in a lot of key markets like multifamily residential, tenant interiors, corporate community, uh, labs and industrial and more. Uh, we currently have three offices in the U.S. We're based in uh, Chicago land, so I'm sitting here from Hoffman Estates, Illinois, and uh, we've got projects all over the country right now, so um, it's really exciting. Uh, I personally am coming up on my 19-year anniversary with the company. Since I've started in this role, I've just seen incredible growth in the industry uh, as it relates to healthy, high-performing buildings, um, and it's so awesome to be sitting here with you all talking about net zero buildings. When I started on our first lead job in 2005, I don't think anybody was talking at net zero. So um, it's really great to talk to you about how we can work together to accelerate and uptake what is an incredibly important uh, metamorphosis of our industry that has to happen. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, I introduced myself on the wrong slide. If we could go to the next one. All right, what I wish my clients knew, um, so I have a lot of words up here, but I'll make it brief. Um, energy efficiency, tax credits, rebates, and incentives, those are all delivered after the project has built. So just kind of the idea of these impact the construction budget negatively often because owners want, don't understand that that's not gonna come off the construction cost. As a builder, we still have to, fully pay for all the materials, all the labor and fully bid the job. So just the understanding that those are gonna come later. And that really, you know, you could also change your viewpoint to look at it as a life cycle cost rather than a first cost. As we're embarking on this new type of high efficiency buildings, um, we're still running into a lot of conventional ideas about first cost. And as, as a sustainability professional, it's really frustrating because um, oftentimes the clients don't understand the significant life cycle savings costs they're going to have over the lifetime of their building by um, uh, investing in that higher first cost to have a high performing building. Um, I think Paul has said this and Kirsten has said this, certain contract types are better than others at facilitating collaboration, particularly from our seat at the table as the general contractor. There's never enough education for all the stakeholders, the contractors, the subcontractors, the vendors, the building owners, the building operators. We need to um, popularize education across the industry because it will help us reach our aims more quickly and efficiently. Ongoing commissioning, I think, I think this was also said, you can't just set it and forget it. High performance buildings have a lot of um, high tech things that need to be watched and calibrated and those uh, systems can be used as a tool to inform future operations. So you can't just set it and forget it because there's actually people that are part of the equation. Bring on the contractor early, this is critical. Earlier involvement le leads to less rework and less redesign and both of those things actually equal less cost. Um, solving problems on the front end is so much cheaper than solving them later in the process. Um, uh, we've never ever, our estimating vice president said this to me and I laughed and laughed and said, I'm going to say this in this panel. We've never had an owner come to us and say, oh my gosh, we have more money than we thought. Let's go spend it. So we have to think efficiently about how we spend every dollar. And don't forget the performance period. Many projects that are seeking a net zero energy certification have a performance period that has to be fulfilled. Sometimes that doesn't start for a couple months after the building is operating until they hit that first net zero um, milestone and then the measurement starts. And so contracts and things like that have to accommodate for that because it's not the conventional contract type or duration, both with your GC and your subs. Next slide, please. 
So this slide I just love to share everywhere I speak, um, and it's from Architecture 2030, and it really speaks to why we need to be doing this work, why we need to be working to advance low emission and low carbon buildings. Um, and operational carbon is by far the most uh, important initiative to tackle at this time. So if you look at this table on the left, you can see that approximately 40% of global carbon emissions are from the built environment. Um, and 28% of that is specifically from building operations. The remaining 11% are things like the construction process and the embodied carbon um, of the construction materials. But looking at this a little deeper, um, two thirds of the buildings that are built today are still going to be in operation um, by 2040. And so there's a huge incentive to tackle this largest part of the building um, portfolio uh, to become more energy efficiency. I think it's like, you know, maybe 1% of all buildings are new buildings or something like that. So we have to address both the um, existing buildings in addition to the new buildings uh, to get widespread decarbonization across the industry. Once we start to get that those high levels of decarbonization through strategies like net zero building um, in building operations, then it's really time to turn and look at embodied carbon, which I'm sure a lot of you all have heard of uh, embodied carbon uh, of the building materials. And that's where you're looking at lower carbon concrete or other uh, materials that can bring down total carbon. Um, so I think I have one more slide, please. One way that um, owners can kind of advance um, general uptake across their project team is to work with contractors that you know are already committed to um, sustainable construction and sustainable measures. We realize as an industry that there's no real benchmark or, or guidebook for contractors. And so uh, with Building Green and the Sustainable Construction Leaders, which is a peer network, we created the Contractors Commitment to Sustainability a couple of years ago. And what that does is really create a roadmap for contractors to reduce their impact in the areas that they control. So for years, people would say to me, well, why don't you just convince your owners to build high performance buildings and as the contractor we're kind of last in line the the building's designed uh by the time it gets to us so it's not really a, a something that we can uh influence but we can influence how much um emissions we're making from our job sites how we're um handling our waste which is also part of the carbon conversation so this is one way you can start to work with contractors that are committed to uh, reducing their impact. And I think that was my last slide. Thank you. Okay, thanks. That was uh, great from all of our panelists. Um, I do wanna move to a time of um, kind of some questions for the panel. Um, wanna remind you that if you wanna join the discussion, um, you can put questions and comments in slider.com. Uh, again, the event code is uh, pound DOE, uh, and we look forward to kind of continuing this discussion uh, for the rest of the hour. Uh, so, uh, Kirsten, you had mentioned some different goals, um, and interestingly, uh, you were getting a lot of questions around what is zero. In fact, that's one of the high voted ones. And can you talk to the audience, and maybe all three of you can talk to the audience about what you do when you're asked that question around what is zero? I know that there are some definitions out there. There are some frameworks out there. Uh, ASHRAE has a standard that I think is going to get published this spring, 228. Uh, but we're getting a lot of questions about what is zero. We didn't like take a time to define that, even though it was kind of in the title of the presentation. So uh, Kirsten, you want to start as you've kind of led that discussion with a lot of different metrics you talk about, and then uh, Paul and Patty, you can join that discussion. Absolutely. Um, and apologies for perhaps not defining it sooner. Uh, but typically, when we say a net zero energy building, that's defined as a building that produces as much renewable energy on site as it consumes over the course of a year. So you have an equivalent KBTU per year produced um, 
that you've consumed and it is for the full year. So it doesn't necessarily mean month per month you're matching up, which is useful since we have weather changes that would uh, impact your solar production. And in most cases, that offset is through solar. Um, in terms of net zero emissions, that would need to be an all electric building. Uh, a net zero building could be a net zero emissions building, depending on if it was or wasn't. Um, all electric or if the client had, and this kind of gets down to what framework are you adhering to, but if the client had purchased offsets for um, their carbon footprint. So there are a lot of different definitions, but generally net zero energy is that one I mentioned at the top of the hour. Um, and we use EUI a lot of times when we're starting to design because we can design to a certain EUI. Um, I mentioned on my chart that I showed, typically if we're doing a K-12 school, a net zero EUI falls between the 20 and 25 range of EUI and EUI is energy use intensity. So that's uh, how efficiently your building is using energy. A lot of people will say it's an equivalent to a miles per gallon for your car, but for building so that you can compare building building to building um, with one metric. I think that helps. I'll give uh, Paul and Patty a chance to chime in. Well, that's a great answer. Not much more to add to that. I'll just mention that uh, for us, the most common effort is uh, pursuing net zero energy exactly as Kirsten has defined for us. And occasionally we'll have some contractors, perhaps those that have a corporate commitment around carbon that will want us to also provide calculations or estimates on total carbon emissions that can still be there even in the case of a net zero energy building. So those are the two things that we most commonly deal with at our firm. And I would just tag on to that and not discuss the definitions at all, but share with the audience, like some of the ways that we're seeing owners pursuing this, um, and that's through third party rating systems. So we've got, there's a few rating systems out there that are addressing uh, zero energy in addition to some that are addressing zero carbon. So we've got LEED Zero, uh, Zero Certified from the International Living Future Institute, uh, Path of House Source Zero. In addition, uh, both uh, the Living Future Institute and LEED have a zero carbon rating system. And there could be even more out there, but those are the ones I'm seeing uh, come across my desk. Great, thanks. And I think that all of this is that uh, all of it is moving in that direction, right? A lot of this is a kind of a directional discussion and as you know organizations uh, meet these goals you helping them with that you know patty you had a, a graph that showed kind of the balance between operational and that embodied carbon the, the materials that we use um, and i think you stated it was two-thirds of the issue is operational energy we're, we're definitely getting some questions around finding materials and, and you know talking about that embodied carbon First, can all three of you talk a little bit about the balance and how you work on that balance um, and, and bring both of those pieces together to reduce carbon impact? I mean, I can start first by just saying a, a lot of how we do it from our seat at the table is how are we fulfilling our clients' um, desires? Are they wanting embodied carbon? Is that their focus? Are they looking at uh, operational carbon or is total carbon, which is kind of a combination of those two things, really their, their perspective? And so we're working closely um, to identify those while at the same time raising, raising our hand and saying, hey, there's also other types of carbons that are conventionally lumped into these things like when you're diverting waste from the landfill or waste to reuse instead of recycling, there's a there's a significant carbon impact there, particularly when you're dealing with, you know, thousands of tons of waste that doesn't usually go into those equations, but it's a carbon impact. In addition to like job site carbon reduction, those aren't those aren't part of your rating system or whatever, but they all add to to the greater zero. So, yeah, Paul. Go ahead, quick, Kirsten, you first. Thanks, Paul. Um, I was just going to say, as engineers, I think a lot of the time we focus more on the operational carbon side. That being said, if you get the right team and you're together from the start, it's very much a discussion between the architects and engineers on how you can minimize the embody, embodied as well. 
but I'll speak to um, how to minimize the operational and that is energy efficiency first in everything. And that is always what we preach. We actually have some slides that are a favorite joke to open at conferences at our firm that say, any building can be net zero energy. And then there's a dot, 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 if you can afford the solar array. Because as I said, to be net zero, you just have to have an equivalent offset on site. But solar isn't free. Installing those photovoltaic systems isn't free. So what you really want to do to most effectively spend your dollar is minimize your total energy consumed so that that offset shrinks as well. So we always advocate efficiency first. And in doing so, you're using less energy in the operation. So you're reducing your operational carbon. Thanks. I, I was going to share that I mentioned that we'd like to kick off our process with a workshop where we talk about these goals. At this point, we've modified that so that we're always mentioning the issue of embodied carbon. What we're finding is that most of our clients are still very behind on this issue. Uh, the exceptions to that are probably higher education that's really uh, seems to be uh, quite adept at thinking about embodied carbon in some corporations especially those, again, that, that have commitments on carbon. But our typical clients are really not there in their understanding or desire to work with embodied carbon. Uh, and so that's why we find it necessary for us to do some education at the beginning of the project. So even when we have clients who aren't really asking us to do much with that issue, we are still typically modeling embodied carbon on our projects. So we have made a commitment starting just last year to model an ever increasing proportion of our projects all the way through an embodied carbon model. And so that, that's that been a great exercise for us. It's taught us a lot about where the carbon is really showing up in those materials that we use. And we're currently trying to target a reduction somewhere around 20% of embodied carbon in our projects. And that's essentially a voluntary effort on the part of Cunningham to try to find products materials that will allow us to do that. So thanks. Uh Paul, you kind of just touched on uh, a challenge there, but what, what other challenges do the three of you hear from your clients around zero energy or decarbonization goals? Well, Patty had her hand up. I want to hear what she had to say, oh, and then, okay. then I'll be glad to jump into that. I just wanted to say, I don't think I fully answered the last question. So speaking to the contractors and the owners out there, a lot of that embodied carbon data comes from a document called Environmental Product Declaration, where they've done a life cycle cost assessment on the product. Um, those can then feed into things like a whole building life cycle assessment. And it feeds into tools like the EC3, the Embodied Carbon and Construction Calculator tool, which contractors are more and more broadly using to help make procurement decisions on low embodied carbon materials. Okay, sorry, Paul, you gonna hit the next question? Oh, I think it was common obstacles. Is that right, Paul? Yes, common yeah. obstacles. Yeah, you started to talk about challenges, but what do you think some of the biggest challenges that you hear from your clients are that you need to solve? Oh, I think there's no doubt, Paul, that I'm sure my colleagues were the same way, especially in this era right now, where we have a combination of supply chain challenges as well as rapid escalation in construction costs on the labor and material side, both its cost, uh, both the perception that these things cost a lot, and in some cases, the reality that there are uh, you know, cost increases related to that. And so I think all of us probably get asked that question on a very regular basis. And so my response to does this increase the cost of the project is it depends. Uh, I'm sure, Patty, you'd probably say that too. Uh, it sort of depends on where the budget is for the project itself. We find on, on projects that are well budgeted with a creative integrated design process, we have a very good chance of getting to a net zero end result. When we have a project that though is already struggling on the budget, it's already perhaps underfunded, those can be very difficult projects and we find we have to get even more creative to find ways to approach those uh, net zero targets. So I, I'm really curious to see what Kirsten and Patty uh, think about these issues right now. Paul, I was gonna say something very similar. Um, I think perception was the word that, that you said that right out of my mouth. Um, I think 
we as designers, we're designing and building buildings every day. An owner might not have that many buildings, right? So, you know, for them, it's the life cycle of a building when they're looking to retrofit or build. And so some of these things, the concepts, they seem a little bit more foreign. And when you hear green, you think expensive. So I just want to emphasize that it, it can be done at cost parity. And that is really, um, a factor of getting that team together from the start. You can't have an RFP in the building is, you know, all the way through CDs. And then you say, is net zero feasible? In that case, no, <laughs> it's probably not. And if it is, it is gonna have an additional cost. But if you have those goals set from the start and people like Paul and myself and Patty can work together for the whole project, I think it's very much feasible. And it's not necessarily true that it's gonna cost more because we're going to be doing cost shifting. Like I said, focusing on energy efficiency first by following the energy. So minimizing your plug loads, lighting, HVAC. Um, if there's a kitchen in the space, that's ten, that tends to be the most energy intensive per square foot of any building. So not forgetting any of those pieces of the pie for where the energy is going, minimizing them all, um, and then offsetting and you end up spending less a lot of times on your equipment, both the renewable, but also the size of, like I said, at the top of the hour, the electrical services and the HVAC system. If you've right-sized it and you've got a tight envelope, which I think was in another question, yes, we absolutely focus on tightening the envelope before we would put in a new HVAC system. Uh, I think it's very much feasible. Patty, do you have anything to add? I do. Um, I would say that, um, Hard bid is a hard sell for a zero project. It is extremely difficult for us to come in at the end as the contractor when you have a fully designed building and, a, and an extremely competitive um, pricing exercise um, to work uh, successfully to, to get that project to fruition. And so echoing what everyone else says, sometimes it's a barrier because um, owners don't wanna bring us in early for a pre-construction process. And what I would say is that is money well spent, giving the team together time to work through all the issues on the project and collaborate is actually gonna save money in the long run. Um, value engineering is an exercise at the owner's direction. They've come to us with a price and we can't price the design at the conventional price that it's been brought in. And, and so value engineering is an effort to pare down things to reach the goals. And so when we can all work together, if we're changing the envelope and Kirsten is adjusting the energy model at the same time, um, Paul's saying which envelope type to choose, we're gonna achieve our results much faster. Whereas if everybody's operating in a silo on a project type that really requires a lot of collaboration, it's not going to be successful. So getting us in early, we're having a lot of obstacles with supply chain that are beyond all of our controls right now, and that is affecting schedule. So um, yeah, that's some of the things. Yeah, thanks uh, for touching on the, uh, the question on building thermal envelope uh, before adding other technologies. You know, and can you talk about your role in making the building thermal envelope and maybe even touch on it from a renovation point of view? How do you make it right? And then how do you make it right such that, you know, like Kirsten can feel comfortable downsizing equipment or Patty feels comfortable installing some downsized equipment because the first call comes back to you at the end of the day. Uh, and Paul, obviously, have a, a big impact on, you know, what that envelope looks like and how it behaves. Uh, can you guys talk a little bit about those pieces? Well, when we're going to design and upgrade an envelope, and that's our first choice always, is to invest more in the envelope in order to make the mechanical system a little bit downsized. Uh, we need to make sure that our client's on board with commissioning, because for us to design something and not have that commission, it makes it very tough for Kirsten and her colleagues to do that work on the mechanical system. They have to be able to depend on the actual delivery and performance of that envelope we've put down in our documents. And, and that's occasionally been a struggle for us. We've had projects where we've not been successful at convincing the rest of the team to invest in commissioning, and it's caused our engineers to have to pull back a little bit. So I can't stress that enough. Uh, envelope commissioning is part of the overall commissioning is critical to making the, this uh, combination of factors successful. 
since Paul spoke more, I think, to a new build, um, I'll talk a little bit about if you're retro commissioning um, or doing a retrofit. So we love, and this speaks to my know what resources are available to you, we love doing blower door tests and finding the leaks in a building. It's money so, so well spent, to use Patty's words. You know, it's, it's not going to cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. It might cost you tens of thousands, but then you know exactly where your building is leaking. And... Um, that's just hugely important before you go and size your HVAC equipment. Um, one thing I will say is we have done internal studies from past projects, and we have found there's a point of diminishing returns um, to retrofit an envelope. So it's important to sort of know your boundaries and again, spend your dollar in the best place. We found the, the biggest bang for your buck comes with a medium uh, efficiency envelope and a high efficiency HVAC system. So when you start trying to get, you know, walls that are R40, just so that you can have the tiniest HVAC system possible, you start to sort of lose those returns. But if you focus on a good, strong, tight envelope, that's just medium grade, you can get those high efficiency systems and really um, spend your money in the best way possible. And if I could just change the vernacular of the industry, I would just change the word commissioning to quality control because that's what it is. It is a quality, um, it is a quality uh, strategy and it serves the building and the owner through the lifetime of the project. Um, this, this perceived cost hurdle about commissioning and some of these quality control things um, uh, are a hurdle that needs to be solved. And then also with quality control, when you get to your builder, you know, as Kirsten was talking about the blower door testing, let's talk about th things that seem really simple, like high quality air sealing, insulation installation, all these things that all come together to really seal up that building and make it tight so that the energy you're paying for is not going, you know, straight out the envelope. Paul, I wanted to add just one quick comment on existing building and the envelope, because of course architects were really interested in the envelope. I think a really overlooked opportunity to improve those buildings quickly and simply is, is at the windows. And uh, of course, we'd all like to replace the windows, but that's a lot of embodied carbon that we'd be throwing away in doing so. Uh, there are new technologies that emerge, especially those using thin glass uh, coming out of uh, other technologies uh, like smartphones, two and three mil glass that really lets you completely rethink the whole window system on an existing building. Even in some cases, it could be an historic structure and still lets you achieve those gains. So you can get the equivalent of triple pane actually fairly simply today. Great, thanks Paul. That, that's actually a, a good lead in our, our most upvoted question um, is actually kind of thinking about you know, what new technologies are out there. And I think Paul, you just mentioned one you know, what is coming on the horizon? And, you know, how does that help us achieve zero? You know, and, and one way to say is, you know, I think we can do it today. Does it become easier with more technologies? And what do you think those technologies are? Kirsten, do you want to tell us about the magic mechanical system that we're waiting for? <laughs> Yeah, the silver bullet. Haven't you guys heard? Um, <laughs> no, I actually was thinking. It's free too, right? You can buy yeah. it for free. Yeah. <laughs> They're giving them away. Um, no, I was thinking about how to answer this question, and I feel like it's unfair to say a heat pump is new, but if we're looking at a uh, market uptake, perhaps we could call it new and innovative, <laughs> um, at least in New England, which is where my work is based. You don't see a lot of those systems, but I think that they're hugely helpful, especially when you're talking about a water source heat pump. Um, speaking about another question with how to deal with the um, peak heating demand and if we require backup combustion. I think with a water source heat pump, even in those cold New England winters, we've been fine. Uh, as long as you have that tight envelope and the well-designed system, the backup combustion isn't required. So I think that's a, a technology that could be more widely utilized, I will say, but maybe isn't new. <laughs> Yeah, for me, it's still the glazing, Paul. You know, that, that's where I would focus on where technologies are letting us have a, a pretty immediate impact on the envelope. It's still tough to take the solid walls of an existing structure and economically uh, upgrade those. And rarely does that happen short of a whole building renovation. You know, 
we talked uh, once before about the problem of so many buildings are renovated a suite or a time or maybe a floor at a time. And unfortunately, those are what I'd characterize as shallow rather than deep renovations. And so we, we tend not to make the improvements we'd like to in the envelope in those situations. I'm not going to talk about a new technology, but okay. instead just bang the drum really hard on what I feel is just so important. Um, again, um, post-construction energy monitoring. So those are te technologies that um, need to be paid attention to more as you're having more high-tech systems, because they'll tell you if there's a gap or if there's a lap or if there's an area. But if your staff that is operating that building is not trained to look at these things and is not trained to pay attention to that in line with the zero goals, they may go ahead and say, yeah, Patty, we know you're uncomfortable and we're cold, you're cold, we're gonna adjust it. So people adjusting systems, not understanding the zero goals of the buildings can work against the, the ultimate goals. And so I just really need to say like education and monitoring together are such a powerful tool for the ongoing operations. And, and Paul, I just uh, I want to bring out a point that you started down on opaque, you know, insulated walls versus windows, you know, that, that we are nowhere near the thermal performance of a window, even with all the new technologies compared to a, you know, even a, a moderately insulated wall. And so, um, you know, that I think becomes part of the design consideration too, and, and balancing those pieces. Um, and the costs as well. So, um, well, I'm going to have one kind of short question here, uh, a little bit different topic here, and it, it kind of goes back to where the definitions were, and that if a zero energy building sells its RECs, renewable energy certificates, um, and a lot of times you do have the option to sell them or not sell, and a lot of people do because it becomes a revenue stream, um, what do you do about that in, in working with your clients? Because that, you know, that attribute really has been sold now to somebody else who then buys it to try to take carbon advantage of it and, you know, avoiding the double dipping. How do you talk to clients about that? Or maybe your, that question hasn't come up for you guys. I can jump in. I, um, I don't think once we've done a sustainability charrette, we've had a lot of clients want to do this. I think the only time it's come up for us is when maybe the client didn't understand that that would be double dipping. Um, and so we just, it goes back to the education um, of the client and picking a firm that can explain all of these things. Uh, if you sell the RECs, yes, you shouldn't technically call yourself a net zero energy building, um, but there is a perhaps slightly touchy subject of additionality when we're talking about RECs and carbon offsets. Um, and I think this kind of speaks to that. Have you created additionality by installing that solar? You're still doing something good if the answer is yes, um, but you might not meet the technical definition of net zero. I see the point there. Great. Anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, most of our clients uh, are not selling RECs. So that's not a situation I've encountered personally. Uh, with any of our clients at our firm. Where I am hearing a lot about this issue, Paul, is in the regulatory environment. So as you know, I'm right here in Denver, Colorado, and both the city and the state have recent regulations around benchmarking existing buildings. And this issue exactly has come up. What if a, a building owner installs panels, say, on a building, but then sells those recs? Can they still claim that they are uh, meeting the criteria established in the new benchmarking marking standards. So it's actually a, a pretty active and hotly debated question in some regulatory arenas. Great. And, and Paul, you kind of came full circle and mentioned another area. You know, we started the discussion around kind of metrics and definitions, and certainly a lot of those regulatory actions are defining them locally uh, and, and driving certain markets in certain directions as well. So kind of wrapping up in that. This has been a, a great discussion. Um, we have only 61 unanswered questions, several of them very popular. We could have this discussion, I think, all day. We're definitely going to take a look at the questions and um, maybe help formulate what future webinars around this topic uh, would be. This was 
a little bit different to kind of bring in design teams and contractors uh, to have this discussion uh, with our audience today. So uh, if we could move to the next slide and we'll wrap up here in the next two minutes or so. Um, if you're interested in learning more, um, there is a, uh, you can download the additional resources PDF from the chat box. Um, and so that is accessible now uh, that has just been put into the chat. So please make uh, use of that. It has links on some of the different discussion points that have been made today uh, from the panelists. Um, as well as resources available from Better Buildings and links to other webinars uh, on the topic to learn more. Um, next slide, I think I actually can, thank you. Um, I do wanna bring up the uh, rest of the webinar series. Uh, so uh, we are on February 14th, so we're making our way through the year. Uh, in two weeks, we can go to the next slide. Uh, there is a another, uh, webinar on diversity, equity, and inclusion in climate planning. So again, that is two weeks from today at the same time. And then next slide, please. And again, I wanted to mention the Better Building Summit, um, which is coming up in April. I would encourage all of you to uh, participate in that um, and have an opportunity to meet your peers and as well as uh, some of the design and construction allies and here, a whole host of great sessions uh, kind of related to this. Uh, there are plenty of engaging sessions for this. Uh, if you have not been, it is an incredible experience. It is held in downtown Washington this year. Last year was in Northern Virginia, April 11th through the 13th. And so come explore the session tracks and uh, book your accommodations uh, on the Better Building Solutions Center. And with that, I'd like to thank our panelists very much for taking the time to be with us today. Feel free to contact the presenters directly with additional questions. Um, and I encourage you to follow the Better Buildings Initiative on LinkedIn and Twitter for all the latest news. You can find out um, our handles by the respective icons on the left side of the, the slide. You'll also receive an email notice uh, when today's recording slides and transcript are available on the Solutions Center. And thank you everyone for attending today.